Hello, hi, it is Kathy Frey here from IMCO, from the International Integrative Maternity Healthcare Organization. And welcome everybody to today's webinar. So I'm just going to repeat that because I've just had a, a ping come up saying we've just gone live. I thought we were live. <laughs> so yeah, it's Kathy Frey here from IMCO. Welcome everybody to this week's live webinar. And um, this week we're going to be talking to Dr. Noor Zaki, who is in Cairo, Egypt. So um, just wonderful. And I can see some of your names starting to um, sign on in. That's or numbers, I should say, sign on in. So that's wonderful. Um, wherever you are in the world, we'd love to know where you are located and what your role is if you're a health professional um, or perhaps you're a mum expecting. And so, yeah, go into the chat, everybody, and uh, let us know where you're from. Just type that in. That would be wonderful. And just a reminder, of course, that down the bottom is the um, Q&A button. So if you've got any questions today for um, Dr. Nozaki, then just let us know and we'll make sure that we go through those. And um, Nora, have a big wave and say hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're starting to see some um, chats coming in, which is um, wonderful and um, lovely. So we've got, oh, we're, at the moment we've got New Zealand, um, Canada, USA, Australia. So look, it's just welcome everybody. It's really great. Oh, and so a friend of yours by the look from um, Egypt coming through. Yeah, that's um, my husband. Actually. Uh, oh, it's your husband. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. really nice. <laughs> He's welcome. <laughs> so look, we'll um, get on to um, introducing you and um, just fantastic to have you all here. So thanks everybody for joining us because without having you the audience, there's not a lot of point of, of us yeah, talking to you. So um, Dr. Zaki is an um, adjunct faculty member and a um, psychotherapist at the American University in Cairo. Um, and her research interests focus on attachment issues, prenatal psychology, experience of the babies in the womb, um, that mother infant prenatal and postnatal bonding um, and intergenerational transmission of attachment. Um, and uh, Dr. Zaki's latest research is focused on how mothers were mothered and you know how this impacts their own transition to motherhood. Um, and Noah has worked as a psychotherapist in both Cairo and um, Jeddah, which is in Saudi Arabia and um, has worked with diverse populations from many cultures and nationalities. So what we're going to be talking about today is how we were mothered, um, how, how that impacts our own transition to motherhood, which of course most of you here are health professionals within the maternity industry. So we are talking about knowing how that's going to be impacting your clients um, and patients. Um, what the format of today is that I'm going to shortly hand over to Noah and she's got a um, half hour PowerPoint presentation or thereabouts and um, from there we'll, we'll do Q&As as well and we'll make sure any of your questions are answered. So um, just to overview the topic, so during the transition to motherhood, um, the woman is moving from seeking care um, from her own caregivers to also providing care to her own baby um, and this transition may therefore be triggering attachment insecurities for some women, especially those with adverse childhoods. Um, so in this webinar today, um, we'll be exploring how the woman's own childhood upbringing and experiences with her caregivers um, contribute to the kind of mother she becomes. And uh, we will also be discussing, or nor will be, how um, this understanding can be translated into early um, psychoeducational, psychotherapy um, and prevention initiatives that are in, informed by that prenatal psychology um, and uh, some very promising initiatives that can positively impact how women deal with their potential challenging attachment backgrounds, um, how they experience their transition to motherhood in a smoother sense um, and how they can come to terms with their own unmet needs um, in their childhood and help them, you know, end up being able to build a healthier maternal infant attachment 
um, starting really from that pregnancy. So welcome, welcome, Noah. Why don't you start with just Hello. telling us a little bit, I've given you an intro there, but maybe just give us a little bit more um, intro about yourself, which you might include in your PowerPoint. And I'm going to hand over to you and um, let you take care of you. Yeah. So welcome, welcome. All right. Thank you, Cassie, for the lovely introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. Let me start by sharing my screen. All right, so this topic is very dear to my heart. It's actually related to my PhD dissertation and the work that I do, whether in psychotherapy or uh, in the workshops that I give. And uh, I started being very interested in this topic because whenever I would go to a bookstore or a library, I would find a lot of books and references regarding parenting in general, parenting approaches, positive discipline, even children's development. But very few books and very few resources uh, focus on the experience of becoming and being a parent. So the parent is actually my variable of interest in my work and my research. Uh, and like with all that comes with it, the parent's world, the parent's mindset and how it influences children. Uh, because our time is limited today, I'm only going to be focusing on mothers and motherhood. But that is a very broad topic and it definitely relates to fathers as well in many ways. Uh, let me start by giving you a spoiler about what this webinar is not about so that we're on the same page. It's not about blaming and it's not uh, about claiming cause and effect relationships, like saying, if you experience this in your childhood, this is what's going to happen when you become a mom or that sort of thing, because uh, that would be too simplistic and not even accurate. And it's not about blaming or holding a grudge or pointing fingers that I didn't get that in my childhood or that sort of thing, because that also doesn't yield the best of outcomes usually. What I'm going to be talking about, though, is uh, first the transition to motherhood and why it's a very uh, rich phase to look deeper into. I'm going to suggest some questions for reflection uh, regarding what is your story and what is the narrative uh, of your past. And then I'm going to explain a little bit how this may be triggered during the transition to motherhood. And finally, I will um, talk about some points about what we can do about this and the things that we need to be careful of. Of course, when I talk about these things, uh, these can be uh, directly related to you if you're an expectant mom or if you're a professional working with expectant uh, parents, that's also, uh, that can also be very, very relevant in the work that you do with them. So let's start with the transition to motherhood. Uh, a lot of the time we hear the question of, isn't mothering natural? And the statement of every mother instinctively knows what to do. And while these are, uh, I can understand where this is coming from and the idea behind it, but I want to venture here and say that these are pretty simplistic assumptions because sometimes all a mother needs is her maternal instinct and that would be good and enough. But a lot of time, we need much more. We need awareness, we need knowledge, and we need to be prepared if we are to raise healthy, happy children. So the question is, are you ready to take a deeper look into your transition to motherhood? Because that requires you to be ready. And if you are a professional working with expectant parents, are you willing to take these uh, aspects of their experience into consideration? I generally don't recommend women to um, slide haphazardly into motherhood. In my opinion, this is not one of the experiences when it's a good idea to just uh, close your eyes, hold your nose and jump. Even though having a baby does involve a big uh, leap of faith, but it also does require a lot of preparation from the side of the parents uh, in the process. So pregnancy lasts for nine months not only because the baby is developing during that time, but also because the mother and both parents actually are also developing a new identity and getting prepared for that new phase. Ideally, this should be happening in that phase. There is no experience that is um, more impactful, all encompassing and life altering more than becoming a mother. I don't think I'm biased when I say that, but really even research shows that. It's really a very psychologically profound experience. 
And a lot of the time when a woman is pregnant, those around her focus on her bump, on the physical experience of pregnancy and of motherhood and, of course, the wellness of her unborn baby. But sometimes we um, overlook the woman's experience of this transition. I mean, the psychological and the emotional experience of this phase. So understanding the psychology of mothers is very important because this psychological transformation definitely has an emotional impact on the children whom we're raising. And here I want to bring your attention to this uh, parallel process that happens during the transition to motherhood. We move from being someone who is seeking care from our own attachment figures to being the person who is providing care to a baby. And that is not to say that the type of care we receive is directly related to the care we provide because it is more complicated than that usually, but there is a parallel process that's happening here and it is really worth looking deeper into. Um, and it's definitely a good time and a good phase to pause and to reflect on who we have been, who we are today, and who we want to be with our children. And since each parent is influenced by previous generations and influences future generations, this is really a very, very important topic to be talking about. The second part of my talk is about what is your story? Or if you're a professional working with expectant moms, working with them, around this concept, building the narrative related to their past. And the story that we tell about ourselves and about our past is very important because this is how we make sense of our life. And usually our story is both shaped by us or created by us and shape who we are and how we do things in life. So it's very important to take a deeper look into that. And when I ask my clients about their story, I don't only listen to the facts about what happened in their past, but it's also very important to pay um, very good attention to how do they feel when they tell their story? Is it something that they um, talk about from a distance, they're able to experience from a distance, or do they relive it as if it's happening again when they say their story? So it's very important to, to take that into consideration also with your clients. And sometimes we think that something happened a very long time ago and it doesn't matter anymore. Sometimes my clients would say things like, this happened a very long time ago. Why do I have to really think about that again? But it does matter and it does come to the surface when we become parents. So it's very important to be mindful of that. Sometimes when we think about our story or our past, we think about our childhood and what happened to us as children. But I usually like to go deeper and earlier than that. So I usually ask my clients, what do you know about your own conception, pregnancy and birth? And these are very important concepts to uh, look at and to revisit at that time during the transition to motherhood. And I mean things like, was your parents' conception uh, with you, was it planned or unplanned? Uh, wanted or unwanted, uh, welcomed or unwelcomed, and these are different things. Uh, your mother's pregnancy with you, was it smooth or did she experience any types of complications, for example? Uh, were there any predominant feelings during her pregnancy? Was there any intense sadness or grief, for example, that she went through? And the birth itself, was it uh, smooth or were there any complications? Was there any separation? Uh, from your mom after birth. And these are very important information to know. And um, actually not a lot of people know these, these details about themselves and about their past. And I would invite you to actually um, ask your parents about these questions if you don't know the answers to them or your mother in specifically, or to encourage your clients to ask their parents these questions. And I want to give you a couple of examples of how these might be relevant when a woman is pregnant. For example, if a woman experienced a trauma in the womb at three months, so when her mother was pregnant with her at three months, she experienced the trauma. For example, her mother experienced very intense grief, and that was a prenatal trauma for the woman. This woman might reach three months in her own pregnancy, 
and suddenly feel as if she is having a trauma. Or she may even create something in her life that feels like a trauma. And this in psychology is what we call the unconscious reliving of in utero trauma. And if you're not aware that this is happening, and if you're not aware of this thing that happened in utero, because even if you're not aware of it, it's in, it's in your implicit memory and the, your body uh, stores this information, you can find yourself repeating some of these cycles and something may happen that you, you're not really aware why it's happening. Another example that happens sometimes, if, um, if a mother gives birth to her baby and this baby was admitted to the NICU, and for any reason, for any medical complications, for example, the mother was not able to visit her baby in the NICU at all. Sometimes this baby, when she grows older and she has her own baby, now her baby gets admitted to the NICU, a lot of the time we find that these women are unable to visit their babies in the NICU as well, because it is very triggering for them. And it was a very terrifying experience for them as babies, and they can't um, handle experiencing it again with their own babies. And sometimes, again, if they're not aware of that, of this connection and this parallel process, they risk not being able to give to their own babies the care that they wish they had. So just by these couple of examples, I wish you can um, relate and understand how these concepts may be very important uh, in the woman's own transition uh, to motherhood. And I want to add that adding your part, understanding and knowing your partner's story as well is very important, not only to stay connected, but also for both of you to be aware of the patterns that may take you out of the present moment with your children. So it's not only your story that we're going to be interested in, but also your pa partner's uh, story. And then moving on to what happens in childhood and what happens with parents later on. And here I want to just give a very brief description of three types of parents. And this is adapted from Barbara Coloroso and her book called Kids Are Worth It. She explains it very simply, and that's why I want to use it. So she says one type of parents is what we call brick wall parents. And this is a parent who is very controlling, very rigid. Uh, there are no exceptions and um, everything is just very controlled. On the opposite side of the spectrum is what we call the jellyfish parent. This is a parent who's very lenient, very permissive. There are no uh, boundaries or rules or not a lot of them at least. So this is the other side of the spectrum. And then somewhere in the middle of this spectrum, there is a backbone parent. And this is the parent who is firm, but leaves some room for flexibility. So I want you to have these types of parents in mind when we refer to the questions that I'm going to talk about now. So these are other questions that are good for self-reflection during the transition to motherhood. So what were your parents like in reference to the three types that I just mentioned? And were your, did both your parents have the same style or did they have different styles? That's something that's important to revisit. And how, how was your relationship with your parents, each one of them? And how is your relationship with your parents today? And what did it take for the relationship to get to where it is today? Um, also, did you ever feel threatened, for example, or unwelcomed or rejected by any or both of your parents? This is also something that you would want to reflect on. What happened when you expressed feelings in your childhood, especially feelings like anger, sadness, fear, anxiety, these types of feelings? What happened when you expressed them? And what happened when you did something inappropriate, for example? How did each one of them react? Are there ways you try to be like or try not to be like one of your parents? So that's also something important to reflect on and to revisit. And I want to say that some of the answers to these questions may be unpleasant or even painful for some people, but it's really an important thing to do, especially before we have children, in order for us to be mindful of how we want to parent our children. And so far, I'm referring to both parents. In, in a couple of slides, I'm going to focus more on the mother, but it's really important to focus on both parents first, because 
both of them have an impact and we can't deny the impact of, of any of them. And then what was it like growing up? Uh, did you experience any overwhelming events in your childhood or later on? Uh, did you experience any traumatic events? Do you feel that your childhood impacts uh, your adult life today, how you relate to yourself, how you relate to other people, for example? These are all important questions to answer. And also, what are your parenting influences? Because we're not influenced only by our parents when we parent our children. There are many things that come into play. And we don't parent, uh, we don't become parents in a vacuum. There are really a lot of things that have an impact. And this impact may be conscious or unconscious, but the more we're aware of these influences and the more we bring them up to the surface, the more we're able to deal with them in a better way usually. Now, how does your story become triggered during the transition to motherhood? Or how can it be triggered in this transition? How you were parented impacts how you parent. This is something that's, um, it's, it's kind of something that we all know, but sometimes we're not aware of how that can happen and we, we might not be very conscious of, what, of how it happens. So let me give you a couple of examples of how something that happened in your childhood and how you were parented may impact how you parent your children. So the first example, if your mother used to leave without saying goodbye, for example, as a child, because she couldn't handle seeing you crying, and that left you feeling very insecure and worried and afraid that she would not come back, for example, and that no one would hear your feelings. You might find yourself with your own children uh, unable to uh, leave them, or you might find that you have issues with leaving your baby or have separation issues with your baby just because of this thing from the past that is being triggered whenever you leave your baby. Another example that actually happened with a client uh, that I was working with, she had a very hard time handling her baby crying. Whenever her baby would cry intensely, hysterically, loudly cry, which happens with all babies, she would really be find herself very impatient and she might even have panic or rage reactions towards the baby because she just cannot handle seeing the baby cry. And it wasn't until after a few sessions in therapy that she was able to have this insight that she was left to cry as a baby or as a child continuously and frequently. And that was a very terrifying experience for her. And seeing her baby crying was very triggering and overwhelming because she felt threatened when her baby was crying. And it made her um, recall all those times when she felt um, very helpless and very vulnerable. So when I'm talking about how we are parented and how that impacts our parenting to our children, I mean, sometimes you find yourself in a situation with your child and the situation itself does not really require that type of reaction, but you are responding to a leftover issue, if we might call it that way. So you're not in the present moment with your child, but you're responding to something from your past and something that has happened in your own childhood. And that is more likely to happen when we are distressed and when we are exhausted, which happen frequently in our parenting journey. Your relationship with your mom might get reactivated during the transition to motherhood. That has been a big part of, of my research. And this actually has a biological component and it has a biological explanation. When a woman gives birth, this sets off in her brain and in her body, the same cascade of hormones that she experienced as a baby when she was born. And that's a very interesting piece of information. And that means that just like when you were born, you had this primal need of just wanting to be with your mom. Every cell in your body cries out for your mother. It's just primal when you are born. 
this same response is reactivated when you give birth just because you have the same hormonal milieu that has been recreated when you gave birth. And this biological need for one's mother is so strong that it can sometimes heal the relationship between some mothers and their daughters. In some cases, if the mother-daughter relationship is too strained or if it's absent altogether, sometimes the woman will seek a substitute mother figure uh, at that time. And that's also okay, but a mother figure is usually very critical and very important during the transition to motherhood. Now I want to talk to you about four different approaches that women might have when they approach motherhood in light of their own relationship with their mom. The first one is the most ideal and the, the smooth scenario. The woman had a positive relationship with her mother in her childhood. She experienced a lot of care, nurturance, love, and she feels that she wants to give the same type of care to her children, and she wants her children to experience what she experienced with her mom. So that's the positive and the first approach. The other three approaches happen when the mother-daughter relationship is strained or uh, challenging, has been challenged. What can happen is the woman may approach motherhood uh, in a way in which she repeats history. So whatever happened with her mom, she repeats the same thing with her own children. And usually this happens without her being aware that this is happening. I think it's very rare that a woman would have a challenging relationship with her mother and she would go into motherhood planning to do the exact same thing. Usually we don't want that, but if we're not mindful of it and if we're not aware of it, we tend to repeat uh, these patterns again. What's more likely to happen though, is women trying to solve the problem by trying to be unlike their mother as much as possible. So just whatever it is that their mother did during their childhood, they would want to do the complete opposite. And I want to say that this is a very tricky thing because the intention is good. What the mother intends to do with her children is, is, is primarily positive, but this type of approach usually lends her in just as much trouble as being exactly the same as her mom. Just this attitude and mindset of defining ourselves as the opposite of someone else or trying to prove that we can do better or that I will not do the same thing, this is very tricky and it can, it can backfire at times. The fourth approach, and that's more positive usually, is that women may approach um, motherhood as an opportunity to become the good enough mother that they desired, but perhaps never experienced. And the good enough mother is a term coined by Winnicott, if you want to read more about that. It's, it's a very interesting concept. And indeed becoming a mother provides an opportunity for a do-over at times. Because in a way, the woman gets to re-experience her own childhood in the act of parenting her children. So she gets to repeat what was good for her and she gets to maybe improve some other things or avoid some other things. And, but generally, if the woman had a challenging relationship with her mother in that type of approach, she tries to be the mother that she wishes she had as a child. And sometimes, when the woman begins to experience motherhood for herself and goes through that experience, what can happen is that she suddenly finds that she's able to relate to her own mother in a different way. She's able to understand some of her experiences, some of the things that were very hard for her to relate to and understand before. She may find herself being able to see it from a different perspective once she became a mom. And since it's well known that um, we epigenetically inherit our mother's maternal behavior and attachment style, um, it's very important, again, to be mindful of repeating cycles and repeating history if we want to transcend the past and stop repeating it. So that's a very important uh, point, especially, and it can be especially challenging when uh, the mother has a baby girl because mothers tend to identify more and project themselves more 
onto their daughters more so than they would with their sons who are more viewed as male opposites. Psychologically speaking, that happens more with girls. Now, I just want to tell you very briefly about some of my research findings in this research, because I mentioned that this is an area that I research. Um, in, in my study, I have found that women who have had secure attachment with their mothers, meaning their mothers were caring, nurturing, sensitive to their needs, during pregnancy, this mother has more positive expectations of herself as being able to relate to her children, being a good, caring mom. She also had uh, lower preoccupations about becoming a mother. And examples of these preoccupations include, for example, uh, worrying that the baby is not going to love me, worrying that I'm not going to be a good mom, uh, being excessively concerned about her independence or uh, the effect of motherhood on her life. These types of preoccupations were lower for, for women who had secure attachment with their mothers. Women who had insecure attachment with their mothers, though, were more likely to project a negative meaning uh, on, on motherhood in general. So when asked the question of what does becoming a mother mean to you in particular, they were more likely to say things like it's an obligation, it's a burden, they had more fears related to becoming a mom and so on. And before I move on to the last part of my talk, I just want to remind you that although everyone is shaped by the past, no one is doomed by it. Because I see a lot of clients who um, have this feeling that they are doomed by their parents to doom their children, or they have this very high fear of becoming like their own mothers. And this actually, uh, there is actually a term for that. It's called matrophobia. It's the phobia or the fear of becoming one's mother. So I understand that there is th this fear that can happen sometimes, but really it's not about what happened to us in childhood that influences our life as much as how we make sense of it and what we decide to do about it. So what can we do about it? That's the last part of uh, my talk today. Uh, as I said, parenting through a fog of internal chaos and having this baggage that we come with can really compromise our ability and our capacity as parents. That's why if there is really one thing that I wanted to get out of this webinar is that resolving inner conflicts and childhood wounds before the baby arrives is such a critical concept. This is something I believe it's like a gift that we give our children when we work on ourselves because we allow ourselves to have a better capacity to be parents and, and that directly affects uh, our children. It's not a button that we click though and it's not something that you do and then all the past wounds and stuff go away but, just, but ideally we just need to start somewhere and then the process takes time and it's a journey but we need to start somewhere and it's never too late for that. Even if we don't do it before the baby arrives, if we do it afterwards, even if our children got older, it's never too late to do that. It's really something that's very important. Uh, so just being aware of our emotional baggage, owning our problem areas, this makes it less likely for us to pollute our children with our issues, if we can put it that way. And really awareness, 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 like I've been saying in so many ways and so many words, awareness of our issues is so important uh, and their potential impact because without it, without this awareness and without this self-reflection, history is likely to repeat itself. We know so many people who have said that they don't want to repeat some things with their children. They don't want their, to, their children to experience some types of pain that they have experienced before, but they get too stressed out or too exhausted or too angry and they find themselves saying the exact same words that were very painful for them to hear as children, for example. So awareness and self-reflection and mindfulness of being mindful of what we do and what we say is very important so that we don't repeat uh, things that we don't want to be repeating. And when I say awareness, I'm, I don't only mean uh, awareness of our past issues, but also of present things that may, may be going on, like the motivation to have a baby in the first place, 
this can include sometimes um, an unconscious component that we're not very aware of. And I'll give you examples for this. Um, sometimes women have some types of motivations to have a baby, like pleasing a partner, like holding on to a partner, pleasing her mom, doing better than her mom, outdoing the, the big sister or someone else in the family, replacing a loss, uh, having a sense of achievement by having a baby. There are so many motivations that can be in the back of our mind sometimes and we're not aware of it. And that's also something that we need to be, uh, to be aware of at that point. I also want to invite you to think about this question or to invite your clients to think about this question. What kind of relationship do you want to have with your child? And to answer this question, we need to be aware of what do we want to repeat and what do we want to try and improve or avoid from the things we experienced so that we have this type of relationship that we want to have with our children. And that's a question that's going to be, the answer is going to be very different from one person to the other. Forgiveness is a very important concept in this topic, and that's not a cliche part, you know, uh, with uh, just abstract concepts, but really sometimes we do all the inner work possible and we do all we can, and all that's left to be done and all we can do at some point is just to forgive and just to ask ourselves to be open to the idea of forgiveness. And by just remembering that choosing to forgive does not change the past, but it frees us from the negative emotions of the past because sometimes people hold on to the anger of the past because it's part of their story, but they just sometimes need to be reminded that forgiveness does not change the fact that it happened. It does not change the past, but it really frees us to be better parents. There is never a more critical time to love and accept yourself more than when you choose to become a parent. That's also very important to remember because that's the place where we start to love and, ac and accept our kids from. So we need to have that foundation for ourselves first. We also need to remember that you and your parents have done the best you could given the circumstances. And that's sometimes something that we need to reach at some point, being able to make peace with it and come to terms with the idea that this was the best that they could do, or this was the best that I could do at some point, uh, and just moving further from there in a way. And definitely reach out for help if needed. And help can be in many different forms. Help can be in an informal way from your support system, from your friends, from your relatives, people around you, or it can be professional help. And in my world, that means psychotherapy uh, as one option. A one on one therapy uh, that can walk, walk you through that process and answering these questions and working on yourself or in support groups uh, with other people who are going through a similar thing. And I want to leave you with that quote We repeat what we don't repair. So that's good news because if we are able to work on ourselves and repair some of the issues that we have been facing, then we're able to stop this cycle from being repeated and we can do um, a, a different type of, we can have a different type of experience with our own children. So just approaching parenting with an open heart as a journey of discovery is really what I'm talking about. Oh, well done. Thank you That's so awesome. much, Noah. It was absolutely excellent. I think that um, for a lot of us watching and listening, we would have um, had a lot of things resonating personally. <laughs> and um, as, as being mothered and being mothers. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know, when you've, because um, we've got various different sort of health professionals here involved with maternity. Um, and so sometimes they're in a role where they, would deal with that or be around that woman for just a short period of time. So say, for example, a, um, a shift working court midwife, you know, she's only got a, you know, her shift or part of her shift that she's dealing with that woman. And then other times you've got midwives who, um, and other maternity health professionals, doulas and whatnot, who are spending a long time, you know, months of, of relationship building with those, with that woman. Um, is there sort of any um, advice that you'd have on on 
the most critical things to sort of hone into depending on the amount of time that somebody has with you know being in the presence if you kind of see if you're picking up something go oh you know you can see like there's some trauma behind that how the woman reacted to something or you know it's quite tricky mm -hmm. isn't it so any thoughts about that difference of of dealing with women for a long time versus a short time yeah of course and the kind more of when you see behavior that, with the woman mm -hmm. when you see behavior that you kind of are feeling a little bit of concern for her of course i, I was saying that if you have more time to work with the woman you will have um more space to do that type of work that I'm talking about, as opposed to if you're just meeting with her for a short period of time or if the the setup is different. But if there is something that can be done in the shortest amount of time possible, that would be trying to um, encourage the woman to be in the present moment as much as possible. Because when we react to leftover issues, as I was talking, we kind of, our mind just goes into the past and we are reacting from a place that is not really connected to the present moment and what's happening right now. It's more related to what happened in the past and maybe some fears related to that. So this would be, I guess, the most, um, the fastest and the most short term mm -hmm. intervention that can be done is to just invite the woman to breathe, to be in the present moment, to focus on what is happening right now around her and what are her current options and what, what are the available uh, options right there. So if it's she's, she's in her childbirth already, we're not going to be talking about her past experiences and her parents. We just want her to be in the present moment doing whatever she can, the best she can in this moment and to just be informed of her options and, and what she can do with them. I, I really like that. That's you, just getting them at that moment, in their moment. Um, one of the things that I've certainly seen, I'm sure a lot of people would agree, that is very effective for doing that, um, is, that is the mother having skin to skin with the baby afterwards, which we know is best practice Definitely. and we should be doing that. But you can, you can see that when you talk about getting that woman in the moment, you can see that occur with her. Uh, and it's a, it's yes. stunning to watch where, you know, she's just been through perhaps years of infertility or miscarriage issues and then months of pregnancy and then hours or days of labor. And then suddenly it's like the whole world stops when that baby is on her chest and you can see that moment of being in the moment. Um, so interesting. And what yeah, about exactly. when skin to skin is a wonderful for, thing, really. Um, maternity, <laughs> it just it, it's yeah, it, it's so. Um, I always find myself personally just a little bit jealous because that was not the normal <laughs> practice when I had my children. So I always kind of like, oh, I wish I had that. They were all swaddled <laughs> and handed to me. So, um, I just want to undress them. Yeah, so interesting. Um, and what about when with um, health professionals uh, who are having those relationships that are going to be going on for months and perhaps they're a caseloading midwife or they um, are a maternity naturopath who is going to be seeing the woman for you know a while? Is there like um, sort of almost a pattern of conversation of sort of start with this and lead to that and try and end with that sort of over the course of of months it's it's a very different experience even though the transition to motherhood is such a universal thing but it's also very special from one woman to another so there isn't really a course of action that needs to be taken in particular steps or a particular order in my in the work that i do i really follow the woman's lead and her level of readiness also regarding the work that we're doing, because we don't want to be digging too deep when she's not ready to do that, but we also just want to invite her to be just mindful and aware of these issues. So it really depends on the woman, her level of readiness, her level of her insight level of what's going on in her life. Uh, and just we, we take it from there, basically. The goal is just to be aware and mindful of what happened before what she wants to repeat and what she would rather change or improve in a way. And this can happen in so many ways, depending on, on the type of work that we're doing. Um, 
Oh, I just have to read out this question because it's not a question. <laughs> Your husband has put a message up here, which was just so nice. I just want to say that I am proud of you and appreciate the passion you have for what you do and the efforts you put in. It's so nice. Thank you oh, so I love much. it. Yeah, that's, that's what we call in the business a keeper. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan is a keeper. <laughs> He definitely is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, a good question, a very good question here. Um, would it would it be great to incorporate that topic um, into pre-birth education, um, starting sort of early in the pregnancy? I'm sure your answer is going to be yes on that one. So, uh, the next question would be, you know, how do you think it's best to do that? I mean, maybe there's some really favorite sort of leading questions or not you know questions that you you know are really good to start with what's your thoughts on that this should definitely definitely be incorporated in pre-birth education uh in a way or another and what i'm trying to do now is uh and i already started to do that with some of my clients whether individually or in groups that we uh i have these classes about like this type of topic that I was talking about today and other topics like prenatal bonding, for example, how to bond with the baby in utero so that we try and have better bonding and better attachment with the baby post-birth. These are all topics that are very important to talk about because in prenatal care, usually what's focused most on is the birth experience and the physical experience and biologically what's happening. And we kind of overlook and forget this emotional and psychological aspect. So that's that's definitely something that needs to be incorporated. And what are your sort of favorite ways to address it? I guess you know if you if you are sort of sitting there with a couple that you know you you don't know that well, you're just getting to know them, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. you you don't want to slide over the topic, but you also don't want to pry. Um, so, what would you be doing with a situation where you've you know, got somebody that you're sort of getting to know. So I, you, with couples in, in particular, I usually start by this prenatal preparation for couples in general. And we talk about things and we work on things related to their relationship, uh, how, uh, what challenges they might face during this transition. Uh, I try to get them express each of them, what are their concerns? Because sometimes the fathers don't get to express some of their concerns during the transition very much. They have their own fears, they have their own worries as well. So I encourage couples to, to communicate in that way uh, and uh, to try and discuss what are the different types they can support each other and how the partner can support the pregnant mom and the pregnancy and all of that and then part of that prenatal preparation is uh, for example uh, how would you like to parent your child would you like to co-sleep with your baby do you believe in this do you believe in that what are your thoughts about this and then they get to have this conversation about how they want to be parents together and how they want to um how do they want to incorporate their own experiences into their parenting journey? So we start from there. What do you want to repeat and what do you want to change? And we start to have this conversation and it really depends on the couple. Sometimes they want to go deeper into this and then we can go deeper with that work like I was uh, explaining in my talk. Or sometimes just couples want to end it at that and this is just good for them. So that's what I meant by level of readiness, because not everyone would, yeah. would want to go very deep into that work, but at least there are some things that need to be covered. Yeah, I really like that. Um, you know, and sometimes it's often a case that they haven't even thought about it. So, exactly. you know, I mean, half of pregnancies are, are unplanned. So, and uh, generally, so, you know, that, there's that kind of shock factors going on there and coming to terms with things. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's and and one of the things I've certainly said to women along the years is that just be what you know, as soon as you have the, the birth and you've got the baby, it's not like suddenly, oh, you know it all and, and you're you're in control. <laughs> and and it, it's it doesn't matter what age those children are, you're always <laughs> going to be facing something that you haven't faced before, that you haven't dealt with That's before. True. And you have to kind of wing it a bit and go, okay, what, honey, what's our parenting philosophy on this? You know, so it, <laughs> it, it, it's an evolving journey, isn't it? Um, no, yeah. yeah. And um, 
And it's it's really a lifelong lesson of being just out of control. And yeah. just oh, being I able to so handle funny. things. <laughs> yeah, just being able to handle things as they come and uh, just being mindful of how you do things. That's that's what you can do. Just that, that's just the most you can do at times. Yeah. And um oh, Barbara Deck has mentioned, of course, I'm um, just put a comment here that at APA. Um, they develop a lot of um, programs that address the important period of that, um, yes, particularly. Um, that's true. I actually want to say something uh, about that. Is, I wanted to mention yeah. that there is a course called Nurturing Connections uh, that is uh, mm -hmm. offered by APA, Birth Psychology. Uh, and it's cool. a really, really good course. It's entirely online it's, and it's for expectant parents, also professionals working with uh, parents. And it addresses a lot of these uh, issues during, uh, starting from conception, pregnancy, birth. And so it's a really good uh, course that I would encourage people to, uh, to look into. Absolutely. And for those unfamiliar, um, that's birthpsychology.com. Um, so mm -hmm. absolute leaders in this in this area, particularly the prenatal bonding, and they've been around a long time, yeah. um, more than a couple yeah, of decades. Apple does wonderful work. Um, yeah. Mm, absolutely. So look, we're going to be winding things up very soon. If anybody's got any other particular questions that they may have, we I've made sure that we've gone through the questions that have come in, which is great, really good, relevant stuff. Um, I'm just having a look at some of my own little notes that I've been making. Um, I found it really interesting your comment that you said um, that we kind of epigenetically inherit our mother's behaviors. And, um, you know, how often do we do that? You know, the, especially I think this, you really have those buttons pushed through um, puberty with your children where you suddenly hear yourself yeah. saying exactly the same thing that your mother said to yeah. you. <laughs> it's more black and blue, you'd never say. Um, but it's like that blueprint that's, that's in there, isn't it? And, um, yeah. some, um, and so much of what you're saying, I think we resonates with all of us that there are things that we go I am not doing it the way that my mum did it or I'm you know we copy them one of the comments that things that we were discussing um before we came in to um go live um you know is uh, is that um aspect that I as a midwife I certainly you know you can just see uh, when women have really solid relationships with their mother, uh, usually I've got to meet their mother before the baby's born because, you know, they're just part of their everyday life and they'll come along to some of their appointments and that sort of thing. And you can definitely see that those women are more chilled out, I think, after having the baby because they've got assistance there of somebody they completely trust whose opinion on stuff mm -hmm. they totally respect um and and the mother or the grandmother sort of almost steps in like a best friend mode um and then you've got of course mothers who to be who just don't have anywhere near that sort of relationship available to them um and i think that sometimes that you're right that they sort of they're, they're physio physiologically psychologically needing to seek out that person and often that person becomes mm -hmm. the midwife or the doula mm -hmm. um and uh, um, it, that becomes a bit of a tricky balance, doesn't it, for that health professional because you absolutely want to be there for them, but you also are going to be mm -hmm. discharging them at some point and you're kind of yeah. leaving them without that help. Um, and, yeah, sometimes those lines can get kind of blurred and you almost feel like you're, mm -hmm. you know, you need to st stand back a little bit for her sake as well um, yeah. because you, you can't, give her give her your all and then suddenly you're walking away and you're not dealing with her and she's left on her own mm. um mm -hmm. have you had thoughts on how sort of health professionals are best to balance perhaps those particularly needy women when you know that you're going to be discharging them i, I would always be yeah, really that trying with to us get as therapists as well yeah that happens with us as therapists as well because of the nature of the relationship that's very intimate and the very personal conversations that we have. And sometimes the lines may get blurry and the boundaries may be very tricky because you want to be there for the client and you want to, to help them as much as possible, but there are some boundaries that you can't cross at some point. So being very clear about that with yourself, what are the boundaries and what are the limitations of your job so that also you don't feel responsible for something that 
you are not really responsible for. Sometimes we yeah. get this urge of wanting to help the client and wanting to be there for them more than we should or more than we're expected to. So just being clear with that with ourselves is, is an important step. And then encouraging the client to seek out their support system, uh, trying to find what resources they have that they can use in their environment and in their life uh, as a coping mechanism because they're not going to be in therapy forever and you're not going to be their midwife forever so they need to have some sort of support and some resources in their life that they're going to be able to lean on later so maybe trying to help them find that also in their life can be helpful yeah and um i i, I used to um, say to my woman um when i did a lot of home visits that i would lead them up and say that i will soon be kicking them out of the nest <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good reminder of, of looking after them and you know you love it and uh so you know like sort of some quite often between my sort of third to last visit or my second to last visit you know I would use that term because I think that it kind of you know says like I love you but I need to let you go um yeah. type of thing and so by the time often I'd get to that last appointment and and the woman would say something like well you're going to be kicking me out of the nest today and it's like they were ready really <laughs> for it as well um yeah, yeah it's um, it, it's it's so a very it, important point as well is really to empower women mm. and to help them find their own strength and their own capacity and to be able to trust their ability to be mom to, to their yeah. baby because sometimes women need that empowerment and need that push that they're able to do it they're able to be on their own absolutely yeah so 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 true mm -hmm. well look i just i can't thank you enough Noah. it's just been so great chatting with you you're you're like thank a bottom you so much. it's an honor to be here us. And um, just wonderful. And thank you, everybody that's come along today um, to be here live with us. And, uh, you know, your presence is always really appreciated in your time. And uh, if we didn't have the audience, there wouldn't be a lot of point doing what we do. So thank you very much. And um, I wish everybody a wonderful rest of their week and we'll say goodbye. Is there anything um, that you haven't had a chance to say, Nor, that you'd like to add in at the end? Uh, no, I think that's, uh, I just hope this was useful for everyone. And uh, I think, Kathy, you're going to be sending my contacts, I guess. So if anyone has any follow up questions or comments about this or feedback, I would love to hear them. Uh, and it's just, it was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Yeah, that's just wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for being here and have a, a wonderful rest of your week. Bye, everybody. Thank you.